This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. And when Jesus and his disciples had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you'll find a colt tied, a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. And this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them. And Jesus sat on the cloaks. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of Jesus and they that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil and asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. The gospel of the Lord. And so, Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we pray that we would hear not just the words of men, but the words of God. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to take that as my text this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. And if you're making use of the Pew Bible, you can find that text on page 981. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, and beginning at verse 1. And this morning I want to talk about Jesus, a blessing to some, and a threat to others. <laughs> Jesus, a blessing to some, and a threat to others. Indeed, Jesus isn't a blessing to everyone. Indeed, to some, Jesus is perceived as a threat. And that's because Jesus represents change, and not just change, but radical change. And not a few people prefer things just the way that they are. But that isn't true for those who follow, who follow and are followers of the true Jesus. And that's because the real Jesus, or the true Jesus, is the ultimate change agent. If ever there was a change agent. And those who know him, and love him, and happily follow him, embrace the change that he brings. Indeed, Jesus is a blessing to those who embrace the change that he brings. And that certainly was true of those who were following Jesus to Jerusalem on the day that was described to us in Matthew's Gospel as he was making his way there for what would be his last visit. Indeed, that's why they were following him, because Jesus changes things. And so Matthew tells us in our text, beginning at verse 1, and when they, that is Jesus and his disciples and the people in the crowd, who had been following some of them all the way from the Galilee. When they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethphage, they were traveling along what is commonly and famously called the Jericho Road. When they came to Bethphage, they came also to the Mount of Olives. Now, uh, as we already noted, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem and this will be his last visit. And he had been talking some time before about this last visit. In fact, in the same Gospel of Matthew in chapter 16, we read in verses 21 and 24, it says, And from that time Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be rise, raised to life. And Jesus said uh, to his disciples, and whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself or deny themselves 
and take up their cross and follow me. And then in the 19th chapter of this same gospel of Matthew, we read, and then Jesus left the Galilee and he went into the region of Judea where Bethany and Bethphage and Jerusalem are all located. And large crowds followed him. And so Matthew tells us in our text beginning at verse 1, and when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, indeed Bethphage, which means house of figs, I guess they grew figs there, was located on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives with Jerusalem to the west of the Mount of Olives, about a mile and a half from Jerusalem, although you couldn't see Jerusalem from there because they were on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. But Matthew tells us, and when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village in front of you, right there, Bethphage. <laughs> and immediately, when you go in, you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. And Jesus said, untie them and bring them to me. Now, interestingly enough, Matthew is the only gospel writer who mentions both the donkey colt and its mother. Indeed, the other gospel writers, Mark, Luke, and John, only mention the colt, which is what Jesus rode. And so we might ask the question, so why did Matthew also mention the colt's mother? Well, perhaps he wanted to make it clear to us, the readers, that the colt was young and that it probably had never been ridden before. This is the colt's maiden journey, if you like. But whatever the case, Matthew tells us that Jesus sent these two disciples and he said, to them, he said to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a colt. Untie them, the donkey and the colt with her and untie them and bring them to me. Now we don't know because they're not named which of the two of the 12 disciples Jesus had sent. We wonder maybe if it wasn't Peter and John we read in other places that he sent Peter and John on errands like this. In fact, there's an interesting similar situation described in Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 7, which actually will happen at the latter part of this Holy Week that we commemorate beginning today. And so in Luke chapter 22 and verse 7, we read, And when the day of unleavened bread came, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, and where shall we go and prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, referring to himself, Jesus referring to himself, tell the teacher or, or say that the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepare it there. They hadn't seen it, just like the colt tied and with his mother. But he says, Peter, he sends, he sends Peter and John. And so perhaps the two disciples that he sent after the Colt and its mother were Peter and, and John, we, but we don't know. Whatever the case, Matthew tells us that he sent the two disciples, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And he adds in verse 3, and if anyone says anything to you, which is quite likely, especially the owner, if the owner's around, like somebody, you know, getting in your car, and you might say, and what do you think you're doing? If someone says, or if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. That's sort of interesting. Jesus refers to himself in the third person as the Lord. Jesus says, tell them the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And Matthew adds in verse 4, and this all took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, sort of a personification of the city of Jerusalem, the city of Zion. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, not to conquer you, 
but to bring you peace. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, not a war horse, a, a humble animal, a donkey on a colt, even more humble, the foal of a donkey. And so what Jesus is doing here is in fulfillment of what was a well-known messianic prophecy. That is to say that by doing what he was preparing to do, Jesus is presenting himself to Israel and by extension to the whole world. Jesus is presenting himself as the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who changes everything and makes all things right. In fact, we got a glimpse of that on Christmas when we read Isaiah's Messianic prophecy in Isaiah 9. Will you hear Christmas? Do you remember? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, that's a kingdom, shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Once it starts, it will never end. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David... And over his kingdom to establish it and, and to uphold with justice what is right and fair. No corruption. And to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And so Matthew says that the disciples went into the little village, just as they had been directed to do. Indeed, they did. They're disciples. <laughs> and they brought the donkey and the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks on both of the animals and then sat. Jesus sat on them. The antis, nearest antecedent for the plural them is the garments. He might want to take out of your mind in the idea of him straddling two of these animals, in fact, and Matthew and Luke and John, they all say that he rode the colt, even though they don't mention the mother. In fact, it's very likely it would seem that, the, that, the, that this colt had never had a rider, and probably the, the, the mother went ahead, and, and the colt followed with Jesus on his back. And so they went and got the donkey and put the cloaks on. Jesus sat on the, on the foal, the colt. And Matthew says in verse 8, and most of the crowd, or the greater number of the crowd, and the Greek is it, which is why they translate it, most of the crowd, spread their cloaks on the road. This was done as a, a sort of a, an, a, an act of royal homage in recognition of Jesus' messianic kingdom. In fact, we have a biblical example of such royal homage is expressed in the second book of Kings. In chapter 9, we read, And so Jehu arose, and he went into the house. And the young prophet poured oil on Jehu's head and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. And it says, And when Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they, they said, is, is everything Okay. That's what people seem to ask every time a prophet shows up. It's like, <laughs> is everything okay? Why did this fellow come to you? They asked Jehu. And he said to them, you know this fellow and his talk? And they said, no, it's not true. Tell us, we don't know. And he said, thus and so he spoke to me saying, thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. And then the text says, and then in haste every man of them who heard this, took their garments and put it under him on the bare steps so he could walk on them. And they blew the trumpet, the shofar, and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Royal homage, 
red carpet treatment, if you like. And so Matthew says that most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others were busy too. They were cutting branches from the trees. John calls them palms and spread them on the road. And the crowds went before Jesus, and they followed him. So Jesus was sort of in the middle. Remember, there's lots of people around. And as they were leading him, and there he was, and some were following, they were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. One of the most common messianic titles, the Son of David. Who's the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of David? When, this, when, this, when Matthew's gospel opens in chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. From the very first verse, Matthew is saying, this is the anointed one, and this is his story. And so most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, and the crowds went before him, and they followed after, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he. He's blessed. And we're blessed because of him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They're calling on all the angelic host to join them in blessing this blessed one. And so Jesus is a blessing to those who embrace him as king and the change that he brings. In fact, many of these people are following him because they were sick and he healed them. Bartimaeus was in Jericho when Jesus came through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. And you remember, and he cried out because he asked, what's going on? And it's, they said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He's passing through. And he said, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people said, shut up. And he wouldn't shut up. And he cried out. And Jesus heard him. And then Jesus said, go get him and bring him here. And he came. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, oh, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And he gave him his sight. And he joined the crowd. Zacchaeus was, or not Zacchaeus, but Bartimaeus was there. And so Jesus is a blessing to those who embrace him as king and the change that he brings. Once I was blind and now I see. An example of transformation if ever there was an example. But that's not true for everyone. Indeed, for those who like things the way they are, Jesus is a threat. Indeed, notice what Matthew says in beginning at verse 10. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem with all this crowd about, the whole city was stirred up in the English Standard Version. In the New English Translation, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Or as we had it in the New Revised Standard, as we read it from the altar, the whole city was in turmoil. In fact, the word itself is, has, generally has a negative connotation. It's the sort of thing, it, it literally means to shake, like an earthquake. Most people, well, I'm from California, let me tell you, if you don't know about it, most people don't go, hey, look, we're having an earthquake. No, that's, that's not a good thing. And so things were thrown into an uproar and, and turmoil, and, and indeed, it, Matthew says, and, and when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. It was almost like in, in the same gospel of Matthew that when the Magi from the east showed up and said, where is he who's born king of the Jews? It says, Herod was very upset and all of Jerusalem with him. Good news to some. It certainly was good news to the Magi. They were trying to find him. It wasn't good news for Herod or anybody that might be affected by what he might do because he was enraged. And so when Jesus entered, the, entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who, 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 who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. That probably didn't help. You may remember, you know, Nathaniel asking, can any good thing come from, from Nazareth? The crowd was happy. 
probably most of them, if not many of them, from the Galilee. They're over the moon. But not everybody's happy. For sure, the leaders of the religious establishment aren't happy. In fact, they will go on to oppose Jesus publicly all week long. And by the end of the week, Jesus will be lying dead on a cold stone slab in a garden tomb. Because for those who like things the way they are, Jesus is a threat. I wonder, do you consider Jesus a threat? Or does the idea of radical change make you feel uncomfortable or perhaps even angry at anyone who insists that radical change is indispensable to a true Christian life? Like one man who said to his son, if you don't like me the way I am, or he said, I like myself the way that I am, and if you don't feel the same way, you just have to find a way to deal with it. Maybe you know people like that. <laughs> but radical change is indispensable to a cr true Christian life, a true discipleship. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians in Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, and if therefore anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's radical change. Once I was blind, and now I see. Once I was lame, and now I walk. Once I was dead, and now I'm alive. Lazarus, come forth. And woman, where are thine accusers? He said to the woman who was taken in adultery. And the men who brought her to Jesus wanted to stone her. And what did he say? Let him, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And back down on the ground, he wrote, until when he got up, there was no one there but the woman. And he said, where are thine accusers? And she said, they've all left, Lord. And he said, neither do I accuse you. That's forgiveness. And go and sin no more. That's transformation. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I wonder, would you describe your life like that? Or perhaps even a more challenging question, is that how others would describe your life? But then in answer to that question, perhaps you might be tempted to respond, well, I like my life just the way it is. And if others don't feel the same way, they'll just have to figure out how to deal with it. Jesus, a blessing to some and a threat to others. Let us pray. What is it, Lord, about transformation? Very radical transformation, not just becoming a, a member of a religious community. The, the, the members of the Sanhedrin and the high priest who set Jesus up. Judas was a member of a religious community. It's not enough. It's a good thing. You're within earshot, or we are, Lord, within earshot of, of the truth. But is the truth taking root in us, Lord? And are our lives being transformed? Even as Paul said, it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And what is it about that, Lord, that sounds often so threatening? Because in our minds, we kind of think like, you know, I'd really kind of like my cake and eat it too. Deliver us from that, Lord, because it's a deception. It's not the truth. And thoughts like that don't set us free. But the truth does. And when it's impacted our lives and come to live within us, it makes all the difference. Help us, Lord, to hear it and to receive it and be changed by it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.